I just want to st start by thanking again the conference organizers and you know everyone here and especially Don Rubin for what has been a terrific conference and I hope I can contribute a little bit to that. Can you hear me? No? Yes. Speak louder. Okay, I'll try to speak slower. Thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to talk today about Loney. Loney uh, is the way that I discovered Devere. Um, I was taking a history class at Harvard, and the professor recommended Shakespeare identified to me. Uh, when I read um, the book, one of the things that really struck me was Loney's process of looking at the poetry. I had written poetry as an undergrad and had studied the work of other poets. So for me, I think you know, that was a major contribution that Loney made that we don't talk about enough. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, the first thing he does is identify the author as a lyric poet, and that's important. Um, and he also talks about the fact that the sonnets are very significant. And he says that they are um, possibly more than any other uh, form of composition, the vehicle for the expression of the most intimate thoughts and feelings of poets. <clears throat> he also notes that by far the larger and more important set, embracing no less than 126 out of the total of 154, is addressed to a young man and express a tenderness which is probably without parallel in the recorded expressions of emotional attachment of one man to another. Um, so I think that that is significant as well. And as you know, that's part of my uh, belief about the pseudonym. Um, <clears throat> whether or not you believe, uh, what you, no matter what you believe about the relationship between the two, I think you would agree that it is um, a very strong emotional um, work. So clearly, again, Loney recognized the importance of Shakespeare's long poems and the sonnets as keys to discovering Edward de Vere as the author of the Shakespeare canon. Um, his analysis of the poetry and his understanding of Shakespeare's conflicted women, attitude toward women were critical factors for me, as I said, and I also think that the early poems, um, although they've been criticized by many uh, people as bad poetry, in fact show us the beginnings of a great writer. I felt strongly, again, as someone who wrote and studied poetry, that a poet's voice develops over time. So I think we'll see some of the echoes. I mean, Loney did a great job, and I'm just going to um, work with what he's done, basically, looking at the echoes of De Vere's early poetry in the early um, poems and plays of Shakespeare. <clears throat> so he, here's his method for uh, looking just at the poetry. Loney first said, we'll try to find evidence that De Vere, in fact, was a lyric poet. He looks at that. Then he takes a look at the early poems that De Vere wrote. So we have the extant poems um, that were published, the uh, majority of them in 1576 in the Paradise of Dainty Devices. And then he looks at the early poems and plays of Shakespeare, thinking that you know, there should be some kind of bridge from one to the other. He looks at the parallels in form and in content, and he looks at the themes and structure of the sonnets, and all of this for him adds up to the evidence for De Vere as Shakespeare. So he starts with what was written about the um, Earl's poetry, and he starts with the Dictionary of National Biography, which refers to his high standing as a lyric poet. He quotes Sidney Lee, who is later, um, and I do like this quote, that Oxford, despite his violent and perverse temper, his eccentric taste in dress, and his, waste, his reckless waste of substance evinced a genuine taste in music and wrote verses of much lyric beauty. He uh, goes on to say, Sidney Lee this is, that Put Puttenham and Mears reckon him among the best for comedy, um, but though he was a patron of players, no specimens of his dramatic production survive, but a sufficient number of his poems corroborate Webb's comment that he was the best of the courtier poets of the early days, 
of Queen Elizabeth. And it's the early days that's significant here. Again, making the argument that these early poems were then followed immediately by the early poems of Shakespeare. <clears throat> he quotes Edmund Spencer um, in his you know, sonnet preface to the Fairy Queen, talking about, you know, this is the specific sonnet to the Earl of Oxenford, um, <clears throat> that his antique glory of thine ancient ancestry and eke thine own long living memory, succeeding them in true nobility and also for the love which thou dost bear to the Halconian imps and they to thee, they unto thee and thou to them most, clear, most dear. So here he's basically saying, you know, the muse loves him, the muses love him and he loves them. Um, other references to Oxford as a lyric poet, he cites the Cambridge History of English Literature, um, and he cites the History of English Poetry, specifically W.J. Courthope, uh, professor of poetry at University of Oxford. Um, again, I'll just talk about the highlighted lines here. He was not only witty himself, but the cause of wit in others. That particular um, line is repeated in Falstaff when he says, by Falstaff in Henry, to Henry Ford, part two, um, when he says, I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in others. Uh, Historical Collections of Noble Families by Arthur Collins in 1752. Again, he says, in his younger days, you know, he was an excellent poet and comedian. And then there's um, the rival, the other rival poet, uh, Sidney. Um, Courthope says, uh, court literators were divided into two parties, one headed by Philip Sidney, the other by the Earl of Oxford, um, himself a poet of some merit in the Italian vein. So this, you know, talking about Sidney and the early Elizabethan poets, Sidney, Spencer, uh, and before them, Wyatt and Surrey, is one of the ways that I'm able to talk to my students about Edward de Vere and his poetry, because we don't teach de Vere's poetry in college, but here's a way in, because he actually knew all of these people um, and was influenced by their work. Uh, one of the things that Loney points out is the fact that um, in contrast to the work of Sidney and the poetry that was being written at that time, that's in the late 1570s, um, De Vere's poetry is distinguished by its reality and true refinement. So this, I thought, was really interesting because it's quite similar to what we find in the plays that he's using aspects of his own life in the poetry, and that sets him apart from the other poets of his day. Um, he calls him the pioneer of realism in English poetry, and he talks about, you know, Oxford basically leading the way for a revolution in English poetry in, in form and format. Um, and I like this last quote where he says, the reader may or may not be able to agree with the ideas and sentiment expressed by Oxford, but he will be unable to deny that every line written by the poet is a direct and real expression of himself in terms at once forceful and choice and no mere reflection of some fashionable pose. And there I think, you know, he's referring to um, the other, his other contemporary rivals. Um, and I like this quote here from uh, Dr. Grossart's 1872 collection of all the poems of Edward de Vere. Um, he calls it, he says, an unlifted shadow lies across his memory, which is interesting. Um, but then he goes on to say, you know, there are these, the poems are not without touches of the true singer, and there is an atmosphere of graciousness and culture about them that is grateful. So we've established, basically, Loney, Loney has established that there's, there are many references to de Vere as a lyric poet. And um, I don't know if we'll be able to actually listen to the um, link here, I'll try. But lyric poetry, you know, was, as you all know, was meant to be sung. So I don't know if we can connect to this recording. Let's see. This is from Magnarda. to me a kingdom is such perfect joy therein I find that it exists. 
Stop there. So that is from um, Mignarda's recording that Earl uh, Sharman is a producer on. Beautiful uh, work of, of much of the music uh, that De Vere was involved in. And that is, uh, was published uh, in a book of psalms and sonnets by William Byrd, but may well have been written by Oxford. It's included in the collection of his poetry. In 1576, when, when Oxford returned from Italy, uh, Paradise of Dainty Devices had just been published. And this is uh, you know, where we have the majority of the poems um, that Oxford wrote as a young man. Uh, the next thing Loney talks about is, let me go back, sorry, is um, the De Vere stanza. He you know, says, I'm tempted to credit De Vere with having uh, developed or created this specific six-line pentameter stanza. Uh, it's the same one that's found in Venus and Adonis. It's found in seven of the 22 poems, um, and it's also used in, in Rape of Lucrece and the following plays, uh, Romeo and Juliet, Love's Labor is Lost, Midsummer Night's Dream, Taming of the Shrew, Comedy of Errors, and Richard II. Um, so, he basically feels that, you know, this is different from Chaucer's six-line stanza and precedes Spencer's in Shepherd's Calendar, but was, in fact, clearly um, influenced by Thomas Lord Vaux, whose work was also published in the Paradise of Dainty Devices, immediately preceding De Vere's poems. So, Again, Loney kind of argues that maybe it was Lord Vaux who invented this specific um, stanza, six-line stanza form, but that, you know, De Vere clearly would have read his work and was influenced by that and then took it to the next level. Um, Loney also notes the Gravedigger's Song in Hamlet, which is taken from a Lord Vaux poem. You can see that in the play and you can uh, see the similarities here. Again, it's a song, but um, taken from Lord Vaux's work. So now I just want to look at some of the specific words and try to compare, you know, one to the other. Um, and let her feel the power of all your might, and let her have her most desire with speed, and let her pine away both day and night, and let her moan and none lament her need, and let all those that shall see her, despise her state, and pity me. And then we have, let him, let him have time to tear his curled hair, let him have time against himself to rave, let him have time of time's help to despair, let him have time to live a loathed slave, let him have time a beggar's orts to crave, and time to see one that by alms doth live, disdain to him, disdain scraps to give. So I would argue that these are quite similar. Um, does anyone know which is De Vere, early De Vere? Yes, Th very good, that's correct. <laughs> and this is, I believe, from um, Venus and Adonis. The next group are uh, Lucrece and um, De Vere, to make him moan, but, oh, so it's actually Lucrece, not Venus and Adonis, to make him moan, but pity not his moans, and let her moan and none lament her need is from Love and Antagonism by De Vere. So these are, as Bonner showed us with the letters, uh, many of the words and phrases are, are strikingly similar between Shakespeare and the early poetry of De Vere. Here's another set, this is De Vere. Fain would I sing, but fury makes me mad, and rage hath sworn to seek revenge on wrong. My mazed mind in malice is so set, as death shall daunt my deadly dolors long. 
patience perforce is such a pinching pain as die I will or suffer wrong again. And then another from De Vere, if care or skill could conquer vain desire or reasons reigns my strong affection stay, there should my sighs to quiet breast retire and shun such signs as secret thoughts betray. Uncomely love which now lurks in my breast should cease my grief through wisdom's power oppressed. And another by De Vere, love is a discord, love is a discord in a strange divorce betwixt our sense and rest by whose power, as mad with reason, we admit that force which, which wit of reason never may. And there's a missing word there. So now let's try again, which one is this? For if I should despair, I should grow mad, and in my madness might speak ill of thee. Now this ill-resting world is grown so bad, mad slanderers by mad ears believed be. This one? Shakespeare, yes, good. <clears throat> this is De Vere again. My love is as a fever, longing still for that which nurseth the disease, feeding on that which doth preserve the ill, the uncertain, sickly appetite to please. And here again is the content as the key. My reason, the physician to my love, hath left me, and I desperate now approve. Desire is death which physic did accept. Past cure I am, now reason is past care, and frantic mad with evermore unrest. And this one everyone knows, black as hell and dark as night, but here's the same theme continued <clears throat> in the sonnets. My thoughts and my discourse are as madmen's are, at random from the truth vainly expressed for I have sworn thee fair and thought thee bright, who are as black as hell and dark as night. And this is the poem that um, I think is, is one of the most interesting on desire by De Vere. The lively lark stretched forth her wings, the messenger of morning bright, and with her cheerful voice did sing the day's approach, discharging night. When that aurora blushing red describe the guilt of Thetis' bed. So the idea that um, desire is personified in many of the De Vere poems, and again in much of Shakespeare's work, was commented on by Frank Harris in The Man Shakespeare, who wrote, Shakespeare gave a mortal expression to desire and its offspring, love, jealousy, etc. Desire, in especial, has inspired him with phrases more magically expressive even than those gasped out by panting Sappho. So I thought that was an interesting comparison to Sappho, who I also teach in my classes, um, and who similarly has had quite a myth built up around her and the meaning of her poetry. Um, you find the echoes of that, uh, this last poem, and this is only the first stanza, but of this poem in several of Shakespeare's work, including Lucrece, Midsummer Night's Dream, and two The Two Gentlemen of Verona. Um, those same images appear in Romeo and Juliet from the, again, from the poem here. Um, we find in Romeo and Juliet with, it was the lark, the herald of the morn, but all too soon as the all cheering sun should in the furthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, <clears throat> and in Venus and Adonis. Lo, here the lark, weary of nest, from his moist cabinet mounts up on high and wakes the morning from whose silver breast the sun ariseth in his majesty. Who doth the world so gloriously behold that cedar tops and hills seem burnished gold? And then this from the poem by De Vere, I am not as I seem to be. Uh, he ends with the line, one of the lines in the end is, O cruel hap and hard estate that forceth me to love my foe. Uh, that is also echoed in Romeo and Juliet. Prodigious birth of love it is to me that I must love a loathed enemy. Romeo and Juliet, as I said, is uh, one where we find many of the echoes of the early poetry. Um, I'm not going to show the clip from the film because I think that will probably um, take me out of the PowerPoint again, but 
Here are a couple of the six-line stanzas. You know, this play is different that it's written, you know, in this form. Um, Benvolio and, and Romeo are having a conversation. <clears throat> At this same ancient feast of Capulets, sups the fair Rosaline, whom thou so lovest, with all the admired beauties of Verona. Go thither and with unattainted eye, compare her face with some that I shall show, and I will make thee think thy swan a crow. And Romeo says, when, thou, when the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, then turn tears to fires. And these who often drowned could never die. Transparent heretics be burnt for liars. One fairer than my love, the all-seeing sun, never saw her match since first the world begun. So I would say this is quite closely related to the early poetry of De Vere. And then we have the final stanza from the play. A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show his head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned and some punished, for never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. So next I want to talk about the idea of Ganymede, who's in my title, and the relationship to the lively lark. Here are some images of Ganymede. Um, it's, he's based, it's a, the origins are Greek, from Greek mytho mythology. It is said that uh, he was so beautiful that Zeus um, turned into an eagle to kidnap him, and um, he, again, from the Iliad, is, is said to have been the loveliest born of the race of the mortals, and therefore the gods caught him away to themselves to be Zeus's wine pourer for the sake of his beauty so that he might be uh, immortal, basically. Um, and although the origins of the myths are Greek, the Roman interpretation focused much more on the homoerotic aspects of this story and the relationship. Um, and I do think this goes to the content of the early plays and the content of the sonnets. Um, a couple more images. So why would Shakespeare choose the name of Ganymede for Rosalind in As You Like It? Um, Many scholars agree that that play, as you like it, is uh, about the idea of freedom from restrictions uh, regarding sexual behavior and gender limitations. So not just about homosexual relationships, but all kinds of freedom that they have on this um, stage in that play from the, the gender and sexual behavior restrictions. And one thing that really struck me when I was making the film and I was in Italy was that uh, people said all the time, piacere, which really means as you like it. It means whatever you like, whatever your pleasure. So I thought that was another interesting connection to De Vere having traveled in Italy and being able to appreciate, uh, as Sky pointed out yesterday, um, the sexual liberation in Italy in the 16th century, specifically in Venice. So Loney, again, talked about this idea that um, the author clearly had some kind of conflicted attitude toward women, and he said that this one characteristic might afford an explanation for the very existence of the Shakespeare mystery. So I think that's rather a strong statement um, about that, and again, it was what convinced me and what led me to begin the journey of finding out more about who De Vere was. Um, and I do think, you know, uh, although clearly Oxford's poetry, as Shakespeare's, works on many different levels and references mythology and uh, uses personification and metaphor, uh, that the lively lark can be read as a poem with, with homosexual um, erotic content. <clears throat> now, the idea of desire and the sonnet tradition is another thing that I just want to talk a little bit about. Um, there's a great book called The Art of the Sonnet by Stephen Burt and David Mickix. Um, Stephen I've had a chance to uh, communicate with because he's at Harvard University and um, I saw him last year at the Writers Conference. I go to the Associated 
writer and writing professionals, teach, mostly teachers, professors, uh, the AWP conference every year, and he was there speaking um, on a panel on Prince and the influence of his work. But he, um, he's now Steph, Steph Burt, and um, when I talked to him, I wanted to interview him for my film, and he did not want to be interviewed because of the fact that the film is about Oxford. But interestingly, as I said, he's one of the um, you know, leading experts. Um, he, he writes poetry himself. The New York Times um, did call him you know, one of the top uh, critics of poetry and, and you know, the sonnet in particular. So in their book, David Mikus is a professor at University of Houston, also an English teacher. Um, he just talks about the form of the sonnet to begin with, and I, all of this obviously relates directly to Shakespeare's work on the sonnets, that uh, if some, you know, the formal strength of the sonnet form can make something as seemingly slight as a lyric poem a work for the ages. So again, here I would say, make the argument, um, as Loney does, that we've gone, and as these, these guys do too, that you know, we go from this early poetry that's clearly lyric poetry meant to be sung to something that's elevated to a much more sophisticated level. Um, and again, talking about the form itself, uh, that it contains and shapes the author's passion and very often expresses a drive toward ideals, idealization, um, emotion cleaves, achieves clarity um, under the lamp of art, and obsessive care and fascination mark the sonnet. So this is all true of Shakespeare's work, obviously. But um, talking about the tradition, when it started, again, its uh, origins are Italian, and Sicily specifically. Um, it was, they were writing about uh, Finn's Amor, a higher eros. It was generally about illicit love, and I think that does relate to Shakespeare's uh, sonnet specifically. Ta you know, talking about the beloved is unattainable. Um, and this kind of idea of the poet, you know, swayed from patient to, patience to wild frustration and back, the student of his own emotions. Clearly, you know, this is part of what uh, I think um, De Vere as Shakespeare is doing in the sonnets. Um, and then kind of the reference again to what he was looking at in his early poetry. He, the, the sonnet writer served his beloved as a knight of desire waiting on her every wish and gesture. So this is, as I say, part of the tradition that I think that, you know, De Vere was interested in and was writing about as a younger man before he began working on his um, later works. And these two guys say specifically of Shakespeare's sonnets that um, the sequence, you know, begins with 100 poems, more than 100 voicing adoration for a young man, ends with a much shorter series, um, cynical and wounded sonnets centering on the figure of the dark lady. But um, I think what their, their take on the sonnets is interesting because these are traditional academic, you know, highly respected professors at two leading universities. Um, I like where they say here it's just proven irresistible to generations, which is true, and that in, in addressing the young man in the poems, um, it's basically talking about a real person. So they make the argument that this, is, this subject, this beloved in Shakespeare's sonnets, is no mere idea, not a creature of the mind, as Dante's Beatrice or Petrarch's Laura and their legions of descendants tend to be, but a troublesome, uncontrollable actor in a drama of betrayal. And then again, he says, we have no idea whether Shakespeare put these sonnets in that particular order, but they tell a disturbing, half-occluded story, and you know, the poet seems to be uh, obsessed with this younger man, and ravished by this, um, the, by the beloved's androgynous handsomeness, and he urges the young man to sire, you know, marry and sire children, as we discussed yesterday with uh, Alex, Alexander. Um, but what I like is what he says at the very end here is that you know all of this is strange enough, 
and clearly raises the possibility that our top bard, as Auden called him, uh, was bisexual. The young man, many have decided, is really Shakespeare's patron, the glamorous pretty boy, Henry Rosley. And so I think moving from the talking about the form and the content of the sonnet to the idea of a poet's voice developing over time, um, this, I think, is the same thing that led me to making the film. Uh, as a writer and someone who teaches writing, I, I feel most strongly that you know, writers develop their voice through the process of imitation, um, distillation of their own personal experience, and constant revision. Uh, this is something we can see in many other poets. So at the National Portrait Gallery in DC right now, there's an exhibit on Sil Sylvia Plath, um, a well-known writer, very well-known for her later work, but her first poem was published when she was eight years old in the Boston Traveler. And what was one of the things that was striking about the exhibit um, is that you can really see the rapid growth in her expertise over time. So it's um, quite interesting to see if you're uh, a fan of Plath's work. It was really great. She did a lot of painting and drawing too. You can see the juvenilia of her. And this was one, a sonnet that Plath wrote in 1955 when she was at Smith College um, that was just recently discovered. And it's, it's pretty wordy and awkward compared to her later work. So I'll just read the first couple of lines. Tea leaves thwart those who court catastrophe, designing futures where nothing will occur. Cross the gypsy's palm and yawning she will still predict no perils left to conquer. And so this, as I said, is a little bit plodding and um, dense compared to her much later work. Her most famous poems, um, the collection Ariel, uh, Daddy and Lady Lazarus, um, Suicide at Egg Rock, they're really strong, forceful poems. But at the exhibit, as I said, you can see her, uh, the amount of work that she did on each successive uh, revision. So I think, again, we talked about the idea of 10 years, you know, for a genius minimum time. From 55 to 65, her work developed significantly. She was a very different, much stronger poet after that time period. And another who I, you know, again, one that I really love and think has a lot of parallels to De Vere is um, Arthur Rambeau. And um, there was a book that came out uh, a few years ago with all his co collected works, which is terrific. And um, it talks about the mythology of Rambeau. You know, we all know, again, he stopped writing so young. He was wild and crazy. Um, but from the... Uh, Academy of American Poetry, they just have this listing here that says his poetry was subconsciously inspired and highly suggestive. His persona was caustic and unstable. Though brilliant during his life, his peers regarded him as perverse, unsophisticated, youthfully arrogant, and he died virtually indifferent to his own work. So again, kind of larger than life character, great writer. Um, during his own life, he only published uh, two poems, um, two short poems, one, one prose poem, Season in Hell, if you're not familiar with his work, is a brilliant work. But he published early at 14, and so there's this idea of the prodigy, um, the fact of his genius, this is from this new book, Rambo Complete by Wyatt Mason, uh, undeniable and remarkable is as interesting to remember as it is essential to forget. So in the introduction, Mason is saying, let's get rid of the mythology of who Rambeau was and look at the work for its own sake. Um, from the same book, the idea that, you know, he started out making smart copies, if not outright thefts of earlier poets' work, is then followed by this period of amazing innovation, quite similar, I would say, to De Vere. Um, but here, you know, r really rapid advancement in 18 months. He moved from the method of po poetic apprenticeship to, you know, including scrupulous imitation to something completely original. So he was basically credited with, you know, creating free verse. 
And then, interesting, also parallel with Rambo, I think, is the idea that, you know, his manuscripts um, he gave to Verlaine, who was his lover, and that in itself was a huge scandal, and not, you know, a happy relationship, unfortunately, but uh, Verlaine then took them, called them illuminations, and saw to it that they were published um, a decade later, and we have no idea, you know, how Verlaine decided on the order, um, it certainly wasn't Rambo's choice. So I think those are two good examples. There are many, many other examples of other poets, and you can look at their, the development of their voice, the early work, the juvenilia, and compare that with what's considered their masterpiece work. Um, Loney's work on the parallels in both form and content theme is um, really extensive, brilliant. I only gave you a few samples, and I would encourage you to go back to the book and read those chapters on his methodology, how he approaches the idea of De Vere as a lyric poet, and then to read for yourself the many, many parallels uh, between De Vere's poems and the work of Shakespeare, particularly the early work. Um, so in conclusion, what's interesting to me about this is that, you know, Loney said, in the future, students of literature and writing are all going to discover this poetry of Edward de Vere, and they're going to continue this work of uncovering the seeds of Shakespeare's genius in the extant poems of de Vere. Well, that hasn't happened, and I think that is our responsibility. Um, I never encountered de Vere's work until I read Loney in 1997, and I would argue that there's been a deliberate effort to erase de Vere from history, much as uh, Bonner, demonstrated that Susan had been erased from the paintings. Um, and as, you know, as a person who teaches English, I feel that, you know, we're indebted to, to Looney for his work and that it's our responsibility to continue that work so that we need to introduce our students to this poet and put him in the context of the other writers of the time and um, let them discover the brilliant writer that Edward De Vere was. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <clears throat>